Okay, welcome everyone to the Northwind Art Center and Port Townsend School of the Arts first art salon since before the shutdown, a virtual one. Um, if you're joining us, please um, stop your video if you're not a panelist and stay muted. Um, I figure we would just start by going around and having everyone introduce themselves and maybe just let everyone know a little bit about your work and who you are. So um, maybe we should start with Erin since this talk is inspired by, by your project out here in Port Townsend. I was worried that was going to happen. I, <laughs> who, who knows how to do this? Um, I, I guess the, the most obvious thing to state, because I'm assuming that most, if not all, of the people um, on the call are going to be Northwesterners, and I'm a little bit of a, of a, a Northwestern adoptee. Uh, grew up in New York, live in New York, spent uh, about 10 years in the Northwest, and have been very fortunate to maintain a strong relationship with the Northwest ongoing, um, both well, in the general Puget Sound region, and have met a lot of amazing people. Um, I think, you know, one of the things that's probably going to tie all of us together is we all have interest in art as a word more than a profession, I think. And I think it really has more to do with what art can facilitate and create for us, um, how it can help share stories, how it can encourage different, you know, inspired actions or ways to see the world. And I think, you know, everybody I, I, in a lot of professions, I don't think it's just the arts, but I think in this particular group, it's just how, how can we use art as that excuse to kind of elevate certain conversations and really highlight things that aren't otherwise being highlighted in some capacity. Um, so I don't know. I think it's just, you know, I, I had a nice conversation yesterday about, about representing the underdog and I don't really know how it ties into this so much, but I kind of feel like there are a lot of underdogs that we're pulling for right now. And I, I wanted to plant that seed early on just to see if there was anything there, but I, uh, I hope that was delightfully vague as an introduction and I'm happy to hand the baton to somebody else, please. <laughs> Glo, would you like to go next? Sure. Um, I have a cheat sheet in front of me because I realize I haven't talked to too many people other than my husband for the last how many months it's been. Um, so I, in case I forgot who I was, um, and I realized I sort of thought of this as a history of how I have come to installation work. Um, and in the 70s, I did uh, photography, black and white photography, darkroom work for years. And then in 95, I moved to the Bay Area and to attend a graduate program in arts and consciousness. And that urban environment got me really, it's like, how do I live here? I'd been living quite rurally for a number of years. And uh, my sanity, I would go to Point Reyes. And so I thought, okay, how can, what kind of work can I do where Point Reyes, you know, nature is my studio. And um, so it sort of developed in relationship to that. I started working with natural materials and simple human materials, mostly that I was light enough, I could carry in my backpack, non-precious. Um, and I would ask myself, where am I? And then how can I connect with this place? And, and where am I was either from an internal thing, what am I dealing with inside or to my surrounding environment? <clears throat> so that was the beginnings of my, much of my work for the last 25 years, creating temporary site responsive work, uh, either installation or interactions in nature, and then developed mm -hmm. into architectural environments. And then I would document what I did um, with photo still photographs. So my work really comes from a desire to bring the outside in and the inside out. And how can I reconcile and integrate those things? And it also uh, comes from wanting to create spaces and places and interact with spaces and places to um, refresh our momentary awareness and deepen the connections between the worlds within us and around us. So that's, I don't know, 
that's sort of where my focus has been and a lot. <laughs> I'm glad to be here. Wonderful. And the world gets even smaller because I made my way up here from Point Reyes. I used to be in the Point Reyes Artist Open Studios group before I came up here. Oh, wow. So that was home for a long time. <laughs> oh, wonderful. Uh, Nina. Yeah. Um, hi, everyone. It's so lovely to be invited. Um, I'm not a West Coaster or a Northwest Coaster by any means. I, um, I split my time between Albuquerque, New Mexico and a really rural part of Alaska. Um, and you're just catching me kind of on the jet lag, uh, weird transitional moment between the two, which is lovely. I share my, my migration pattern with the sandhill cranes and I uh, beat them home this year. So that's been interesting. Um, I was thinking about when I met, first met Jenna, our lovely moderator, I was getting a master's degree at an art school, but I was studying critical economic theory and looking at urban infrastructure, um, which is kind of wild because my, my deep love for my entire life has been, um, has been nature and wildness and wilderness. And I think uh, becoming a student of human economies really uh, has made me under, want to understand deep systems and deep time in a different way, the kind of things that we have created as society, whether they're gender constructs or racial constructs or things like that, and then how those are um, impacting our environments, both wild environments and urban environments. So um, yeah, I do, I do a lot of different kinds of art forms. Um, like if you were to go to one of my shows, you would think I was a drawer. I make drawings out of wild harvested really weird materials like radioactive charcoal and um, industrial pulp mill waste and things like that. But um, if you were to encounter me these days, I'm doing a lot of public speaking and um, teaching and working with um, students in resource management and science fields to kind of understand those big systems that they are interacting with and to encourage, encourage curiosity and interdisciplinary um, empathy is kind of my big thing right now. So. Um, yeah, thinking about the built environment and how we relate to history within the built environment tonight is going to be super interesting to me. And um, yeah, I'm thrilled to be here. Thank you. Shall we? Hi. Thanks, Jenna, for inviting me to be part of this panel. I'm honored to be with these three amazing artists. And um, I also identify as an artist. I grew up in the Pacific Northwest and Echo Nina just the wilderness is really my sanctuary and space and has been for my whole life. So like every, I feel like everything that I I do and identify as being artist, writer, art curator, oral historian, it often comes back to land and space. Um, and now as the executive director of a historical society and an art and history museum, I think what is really compelling about this work right now is that I get to be the instigator of a lot of those things, combining a lot of those things together, encouraging people to be part of those things in all kinds of different ways. And yeah, it's, it's a, been a fascinating journey, park ranger, radio DJ, and it all, it all fits somehow, like all of these, <laughs> these seemingly strange swirly paths um, and you end up in a place like Port Townsend where there are a lot of convergent conversations around these same th these topics around open space and and public land and who does it belong to and who gets to use it so yeah thank you again for inviting me I'm really excited to hear the perspectives of these artists and um, thanks yeah that's me Great. And for those of you who have been kind of trickling into our salon, I just want to let everyone know that I'm keeping everyone muted and have their cameras hidden so that we can have kind of integrity with the panel and recording and that there will be time for your questions and comments through chat toward the end of the meeting. So thank you for being here. Welcome. There's almost 30 of you here. So um, very glad to have you all. And so, Aaron, I'd like to start with you in terms of um, maybe you could share the inspiration and process of your Fort Word project. Um, 
I'm torn between staying on script and going off script. That's going to be something I'm going to be battling the whole entire time, I think. Um, I, so Shelly, you just said something interesting, right, about these different paths that we follow to get us from a place to a place. And we're all in a place right now in a moment where we're doing certain types of work for certain reasons, but the path that brought us here and the various, I'm, I'm sure we all, you know, not just us, but everybody on the call and most of the people in our lives have these very, you know, fractured paths that bring us to a place. And the real magic happens when you start to pull all of those things together and your life becomes kind of this coalescence of your experiences. And I think the work can become richest when you can harness some of that energy and then create something that can then deploy back onto the people. And I think one of the things, you know, that's sort of obvious to anyone that's ever been to Fort Warden is there's so much of that magic already there. There have been so many people that have traveled through that space for so many decades. It's taken on different shapes and forms um, from, you know, treatment set, well, uh, from before that, you know, pre-development to military development, to treatment, to park, to whatever it's going to become in the future and all of the different faces and places that um, have frequented it. And I think a year ago, I visited the fort for the first time, and you just walk the grounds and are just almost clubbed over the head with kind of the, the, the integrity and the magic and the, the depth of personal energy that's embedded into the structures and into the ground there. Um, I'm not smart enough or clever enough or resourced enough to do anything with that information other than to just try to talk to people and see who and how they can help kind of pull some of those stories out. Um, and then, you know, again, sort of like the intro, the art becomes the excuse, right? Like, how can you do something and sort of tuck it in on, under the blanket of, of art? But really what you're trying to do is you're just trying to give a voice to all of these things that we're not really paying attention to. Um, so in, the, in, in Fort Warden in particular, um, the depth of those stories and kind of like the depth of history that existed there and kind of the magic of discovery that takes place when you just walk around, it felt... It, it felt like they were just stories that wanted to be told and it felt like encouraging people to kind of explore the grounds on their own terms and kind of, you know, come up with their own scripts and have their own reactions and responses to things that people had already said. You don't have to add anything. You just really have to kind of tease some stuff out already. Um, it was sort of a, a perfect storm and I, I'm just grateful that the fort sort of let me play with it. Um, and, and I'm grateful that the, the partners on, on the ground were, were interested in kind of playing with me. And I think it turned out to be a really nice thing. And I'm really curious to see how it's going to, you know, live on for the next six weeks and maybe persevere beyond that. But uh, for the most part, I'm sort of circle answering the question. But there are just these things all over the world. It's a cool place, the world. And there are stories and there are things that just want to be told. And I think all we really have to do is listen and just retell them and just not shy away from what the realities, what the truths are. And I think if we don't, you know, kind of like overplay our hands too much, the magic just comes out. Erin, will you spend like one minute describing the project? Like you just did such a beautiful job of describing the energy around the project, the impetus, but for those of us that are not in the area, it'd be really cool to hear your- um, there, There's no project, Nina. It's actually, it's just made up. So we just oh, talk about it as flowery as possible and make it sound really cool. And then everybody just walks away thinking it's the coolest thing ever. It's like a total sham. Not true. Um, There's a whole map to this thing. It's okay. So the, the fort, um, Fort Warden is a park, state park, um, decommissioned military outpost. So there are various military structures that have been repurposed for different things all over the acreage. Um, and I focused on 12 um, decommissioned military batteries that are not really used for anything. So they've just been kind of weathering into the ground, uh, sort of in the aesthetic of the ruin that we're probably all familiar with. And then worked with those surfaces and just applied excerpts from oral histories that um, Shelley and the Historical Society had worked with um, and put those excerpts onto the walls to kind of cover a spectrum of different themes and topics, different years, but they were sort of thematically random almost. It wasn't supposed to be running on one theme, but just as you kind of walk through the park, you get tickled by something different, or maybe, you know, you find one, you don't find the other, um, but just a way to kind of navigate and realize that there's a lot more than meets the eye. So they were just walls, stenciled, you know, excerpts on the walls pretty much, but the, uh -huh. the context kind of really plays it up. Erin, is there a map 
that someone can, so they, if they want to not miss any. Yeah. Okay. The, the map isn't good enough to help you not miss any, so you'll still miss some, but there will be a better map that I promise by the end of the month that'll help you not miss any. But I also encourage you to miss some. It's not a, it's just, you know, choose your own adventure, discover as, as you will. And I think finding them is less important than having the experience of looking for them. Yeah. That's great. The map available through the Centrum website, is that where someone would find it? Uh, currently, I, you know what I can do? I think I can put a link in the chat. I'm going to try to do that. That would be great so that yeah. everyone participating can, once the air clears and it's not so smoky, they can all take a hike and take it in. So Shelly, I know that art and history and their overlap is very important to you. Can you share more about your connection to this project and to the fort overall, and even the involvement of the Sklalem tribe? Oh, sure. Yeah, and you know, that's, um, that was something that I wanted to start with was the recognition that um, we, that Fort Warden and Fort Townsend where I sit is indigenous land. Um, and in particular where I'm sitting now was the village of Katai, Sklalem village at the point of white settlement of this space. So we're talking about public space and open land and, and open space and and land with architecture on it now and all of that. It's it is it's good to recognize um, that this is indigenous land. And I first learned about this project through the Arts Commission. I sit on the city's Arts Commission, and I'm privileged to be able to uh, spend some taxpayer dollars. <laughs> Um, on our, the art events and projects that happen in our city. It's exciting to be able to help grant those dollars out to artists in our community. And this project was brought forward as a, a worthy project for grant funding. And so that's how I learned about it. And then it, it was a really natural fit, I think, for um, to partner on something that's about words, that's about, uh, you know, bringing forward uh, first person voices into a, a public space like this that wanted to reach back into history. And in general, this is exactly the kind of project that I get really excited about. Um, I think about some of the projects that I've experienced um, primarily in my time in Seattle. I lived in Seattle for about 13 years and I uh, was able to participate in some, uh, in the, uh, this artist Susan Robb, her, her project called The Long Walk, was a walk, a 40 mile walk with 50 people over four days where we interacted with art the entire time and you had, it, you know, lots of interpersonal connection was happening, connection with land and space. Um, and it, there's just, those projects that like you just keep returning to, that even just thinking about them fills the well and makes you feel like there are so many possibilities for, for things that we can do more that we can do together in our shared spaces to connect with each other um, and connect back in time and make history relevant to people. Um, and artists have the ability to do that in in ways that we would like folks you just wouldn't think like you don't have to sit down and look at a history book for history to be to to learn about history for it to be relevant to you and artists can help lead the way and show the way into history and make it fascinating and i think aaron's project does that so that's how i became familiar with it that's you know, one of the reasons that I'm really excited about it because it does make that um, unexpected connection between art and history. Sounds rad. I, I also, so Shelly, we kind of had a little touch on this uh, conversation a couple weeks ago, but it's also so nice to think about history um, as a real thing not necessarily as something that was, you know, factual in the past, it's only words on paper, but to personify it and really just kind of let it, let it live as something that happened before, but it's not really any different than something that's happening now or something that'll happen in the future. It's still us as people 
you know, living and sharing and talking and experiencing and those, that's what history is, right? It's just a question of whether or not the history is happening, has happened or will happen. Yeah, absolutely. And those first person voices, that's one of the reasons I think I'm so passionate about oral history is because it, it, it's you or me or anyone on this Zoom call, all of your histories and your stories are just as important as Thomas Jefferson or what, whoever, you know, like we all have <laughs> amazing, incredible stories to share. And that is one way that oral history is, it's history by the people, for the people, about the people. Yeah. It's also more interesting that way. Yeah. I mean, I'd rather talk to somebody who I have something to say, you know, it's whenever we're in these conversations and you feel like you have to be on and you have to be all formal and tight about it. And it's, those are, we all dread that a little bit, you know, but when you can actually talk to real people, the connection is just accelerated so much. You get so much further, so much faster, and it's so much easier to reach people at a real level. And when people aren't sort of skirting around whatever it is they're trying to talk about, you know, I, I like to believe because I'm an idealist that even at the highest level of people trying to influence policy or whatever they're trying to do, um, if you could just cut through a lot of it and just be human first, you know, or at least try to do something at the lowest level and, and try to get people, you know, to grow more comfortable with how important it is to be human first. Um, it, it, it is the most important thing and we are as important as Thomas Jefferson. I just wanted to say that out loud. <laughs> Well, I, this might be a little bit of a non sequitur, but I'm hearing and recognizing something that Aaron, you as you don't live in Port Townsend, you're a, you were a visitor there, you were able to observe these things as a visitor and respond to them. And there's sometimes this incredible gift of not being part of a community, being an interloper, having this um, sense of awe and surprise and wonder that happens and then being able to talk to people about that not necessarily as a local person i feel like there's so much focus on like local storytelling um which i totally appreciate i'm very involved in that kind of stuff but like i i also really appreciate that sense of like the the visceral hit the somatic response to a place that sometimes happens when you're new and that that is that's like a fresh take on history i think it's really beautiful so and I just i I, I really appreciate hearing you say that because I think as a person, and I'm sure you can relate to this, I'm sure a lot of us can relate to this, is when you move around, I think sometimes your reason for being there is challenged. And it's challenged for, for right reason, right? Like nobody, you know, I have no interest in representing a local perspective if I'm not a local. That's, that's not fair. That's not accurate. That's totally obnoxious. Um, but I do think that there are different things that a local can contribute to a particular narrative. And then there's something that an outsider can contribute. And even if I'm in New York, I think my perspective and my work is going to be different than if I'm elsewhere. And I think you're right. You go into a place and you aren't clouded. Let's be even a little bit more direct about it. Like how cool are vacations <laughs> and vacations are great because you go there and you look at things differently. And as soon as you get home, you stop taking you know, certain things, uh, you stop appreciating certain things and you start sort of focusing on other things. And a lot of times you lose that kind of spirit, that inspired way of looking at the world. And I also think there's, I like the word awe. There's an odd admiration you have for a place that's not your place. There's an eagerness and like an aggression to learning about it really quickly. Um, and you're at the mercy of the people who are the locals and are the experts. So it's like everything gets kind of run through that. And really you're just there to, I don't know, like, kick up the dust and make sure that all that inspired energy isn't being taken for granted. I think also, Erin, that your project at this time when we're living, I, I, I mean, I've never been so aware of living through history. Like at some point, we're going to look back on this and have a totally different perspective. But it's like history is now. But your project, it's like, it there's something that happens when history is now it's in your face and almost like you can't see it but with with your project it gives some distance and perspective and different stories there's it's more spacious and i think it can help us maybe uh bring more spaciousness in what we're living through now and then so glow i guess i want to ask a question to you about that comment, right? You know, what happens when there's no project and what happens when we're into 2022 and we're walking down the street 
how, how do we continue to appreciate that same exact sentiment? How do we keep it part of our, our everyday walk, our everyday talk, our everyday experience? Good question. Good question. More projects. Can I, we do I, it? I don't know. <laughs> but I yeah. think it is a good question. You have 34 minutes to figure it out. I kind of, can I, can I jump in, Glo, do you mind if I kind of? Yeah, absolutely. I, I'm a huge cheerleader for curiosity and taking curiosity really, really seriously. Like we would not know who we were unless we were curious about ourselves. We would not become scientists or politicians or artists or historians if we didn't have curiosity. So I think taking those things that help us move forward in the path of time rather than stagnating and you know having this backward gazing thing like to take that really seriously and to start advocating for that in social and political settings is is going to be the thing that might help us transition out of this incredibly challenging moment i i have so much faith in, the, in curiosity i'm not the most hopeful person i'm kind of a pessimist but um you know, curiosity allows us to experience the whole spectrum of emotions, both positive and negative. It allows us to experience the degradation of the natural world and our role within it, and also maybe a, a more um, adaptive or positive place in the future. But without curiosity, we're never going to like explore those paths. So I don't know if it has to be a project, but um, individual and collective curiosity is something I'm a huge advocate for. And, and I think so many of us do what we do because of curiosity but we have a hard time naming it because we're supposed to be creating solutions or we're supposed to be creating products and if just saying like i'm putting one step in front of the other because i'm curious about where i'm going that's incredibly important right now as society so that's that's my point of view <laughs> i i couldn't i'm so happy you just said all of that and i love it that it's not just curiosity it's kind of like the grown up person who never stopped being a child, right? Or curiosity is just like the entertainer or something that's a little bit more playful, but not taking it seriously. I mean, curiosity applies to all of the innovative professions, right? And it is the magical fuel that kind of moves us forward because when you're not curious about looking for new solutions or, or trying to understand better what's going on, um, then you just become this acceptor of things and the world just stops, right? I mean, there isn't, there isn't really any reason to move forward if you're not curious about something that's around the corner or learning something new about someone new or about any of the things that you just outlined and it is positive or negative it's kind of you don't need a project to move through the world as a curious you know cat right like all you have to do is just use the tools that you have inside your mind and use your mouth to sort of share them with other people and um, I'm jumping the gun a little bit because I, I know that there's a comment in the in the chat that's talking about the the particular crisis right now in the environment and we can't go outside and I, I don't know a lot about a lot, and I'm certainly not going to sit around as a scientific authoritarian on anything, but I'm pretty sure we're going to be able to go outside at some point. And the curiosity will still be there. And if it's in two days or two weeks or two months, um, yeah, I mean, that'll never, never cease to be an option for us. And I think that that's kind of something that we can all continue to give each other. And that's a sort of a way that'll you know, propel us through these types of challenges and really kind of move things ahead when we want to look at something and look, figure out a way to kind of move it past the point that it's in. Mm -hmm. I'm just rambling, but. Yeah. It makes, I, okay. it makes me think of curiosity as being this spark, like a sparkler and you know how one person's curiosity ignites another person's just the way Aaron, your project, having it out there for people to walk past, sparks them you know and i think that's you know again the point where the the words themselves and the sentiment of what they're drawn from and what they connect to historically is an aspect of it and it's important but it's also how do you interpret it what do you care you know like not what do you care but like what does it spark for you you know what does it spark for the person you may or may not be walking with you know what story does it then prompt or memory does it sort of jog in your own mind um, and how does tomorrow become different than today was because you found this thing or you had this experience or you had this conversation that you didn't have otherwise. And yeah, I mean, it's, it, 
it, it is a magical spark for a lot of things. And that's, that's where the magic starts to happen. It's not, it's not developing the project or having the project mean something. It's when someone else interfaces with it, what does it do for them in that moment? And how can they take that as part of their now new everyday experience? And does it matter? And if it matters, you know, just a little bit, then, then that's a successful experience and that's meaningful work. And then that becomes something that really has this, you know, longer term catalytic effect. When I'm just looking at how this question is worded, that there's this longing to go and experience it and like to, to find your emotional place within history or within curiosity is like even one, one more amazing step to like find yourself longing thing, which, I think is going to be a silver lining of these COVID times is we might miss things. Um, we might have taken things for granted and what we're longing for re reveals what we value. And sometimes this kind of unknown experience, like this idea of discovery or, you know, that people want to see what you've made, Aaron, without really knowing what it is. That shows a lot about the human mind, which I appreciate. Yeah. And I, I think that I like to really lean into that. I mean, I think there's, there's no, you know, shame whatsoever on my end. In fact, I, I appreciate it more if you're just drawn there by the curiosity and not really caring or knowing what it is that you're drawn to, because then, then the, the overall mission, the objective of it, which is to basically, you know, be a spark for the, for these things, then it's working. And then it, again, it becomes, it becomes about your experience. Do we just keep talking or is there? I don't know. I was gonna, I was gonna add something that the, the curiosity, what Nina was saying about curiosity, um, it made me think, again, so much of my reference goes back to my training and experience as an oral historian and my passion for that. And that a lot of that comes from curiosity for sure about someone's life and wanting to just know every detail. And, um, but, Part of where the practice, I think, helps me in so many other ways of my life is that it's taught me how to ask lots of questions all the time and like never, ever stop asking questions. And I feel like the questions I settle on lately a lot in this position that I'm in now at the Historical Society is who's being represented, who's not being represented, <laughs> what is architecture telling us that's sort of really blinding us or like putting this sort of physical blockade in our way of what all the rest of the stories are? And how do we continue to, despite what we might see and is so ever present visually for us, how do we continually ask questions and not stop asking? And and raise up voices that just haven't have not been listened to or heard or centered um yes yeah, so you know and i think in terms of the landscape of fort warden in particular it's been many things through the years and right now it's called fort warden it looks like fort warden but there are how many different organizations doing all kinds of amazing things in this space. And if you were to just walk through there in what May COVID time, it almost completely abandoned, right? Like it's, it just is architecture on land. So we, we have to be curious and continually ask questions if we want to get beyond that. So thanks, Nina, for that. I love being serious about curiosity. I, I love that. So I'm going to keep that with me. I, um, I don't know exactly if this ties in directly, but I want to just kind of give a, a shout out to Tim Caldwell, who I spoke with earlier this week, who um, some people on the call might know, but he seems to know everything about the history of the fort and has really interesting perspectives about things. And one of the things that he said that kind of resonated a lot was, um, the relationship of the fort to the town and how it almost felt like, despite that it was a fort and it went through these different iterations, it almost had this kind of educational feel to it. Like it was like an educational hub, a cultural hub, um, even during its like military heyday. 
and how it sits in the landscape and continues to just provide all this cultural energy and cultural opportunity for the, the community around it. Um, it's kind of this, you know, again, when we talk about curiosity and we talk about like the, the ways in which these things can, can inspire and give gifts to the surrounding community. I, I don't know if it's, I don't want to go off on a side conversation about higher education or anything like that, because we'll probably, you know, smash our heads into a wall, but, um, but there is something that's kind of special when you look at something that is so not a school or not an educational, you know, industry or whatever you want to call it, um, but that it can still have that radiant effect and it can still feel like the kind of place. And I think that's as an idealist, like looking at what the school can do is you go into it and then you can come out of it with your curiosity sort of insatiated. Is that a word? Um, and I think the, you know, the fort or spaces like that all, all over in cities around the world, they, if you can go into a place and come out of a place and not necessarily have to do like one particular thing, there are so many different programs, there's so many different organizations, institutions, there's so much history that's still yet to be written at the fort. Um, I don't know, I, I mean, maybe it's a little late and my words are gone, but uh, I just feel like it's it's such a cool place that you can literally walk in with one expectation and walk out having a completely different experience. And that's almost part of the point. Aaron, thank you for being up so late on the East Coast for this. Oh, I'm, I just wanted to um, kind of go to the chat and bring in what some people have to say. Um, Rico made the comment um, that as a culture, we are lazy. What is great about this exhibit is that it asks us to be continued discerning, to be curious, to reflect on where we are today and how our path is informing our current position. So um, I just thought that was very, very insightful. There's Rico, hello. Thank you for your, your very insightful comments, absolutely. Um, and then- Wait, Can I comment on Rico's comment? please because i don't i don't believe that he wrote that i think it came from someplace else perhaps. oh my god why are you so mean <laughs> aaron and i have been colleagues for a long time and yes that came from my brain to the typed text i You're so mean seriously in all seriousness i do i do want to respond to that with with um a couple of points and Shelly, I'm going to kind of ask you maybe to, to chime in on it also, but um, it was so timely. This is a really literal connection, but it was so timely to learn so much more about um, Fort Warden's position in 1918 and how it sort of persevered through the pandemic then and how there were so many lines in the transcripts from the oral histories that could have literally read from today, oh. you know, and it's, I mean, that's grounding and it's a little bit kind of demoralizing in a way because it really makes the magnitude of what's happening now seem really real but it's also really inspiring to to learn that 112 years later um this is not new and you know history does tend to repeat itself that's one of the you know most fascinating cliches and how and why we choose to continue to dismiss that and continue to look at our past as something that's archaic relative to how smart we are today um is also befuddling but uh, I just thought that there was there was a lot of really inspiring energy going back to that and realizing that you know again we'll we we've gone through this before we'll go through it again. Um, it's not a question of whether or not we can get through it. It's just a question of whether or not we do a better job learning from it. Also, Michelle Hayward from Centrum said she's super interested to hear panelists' thoughts about the role of interventions or artworks that take place in public spaces or in somewhere like a park, how can we build more value around this and also think about it critically? I'll jump in on that. Um, I, the way that my work happens is I, I kind of scrap this idea that something is a park right now and I start with what it was maybe a billion years ago and try to really understand it with that kind of deep time perspective and everything that has been not the dominant perspective within it but the the 
what's been subjugated to the subterranean and the stratas that are underneath and um you know how wonderful that as humans we're like alive in this like tiny glimmer of moment on this hurtling ball of stardust and we get to be together and have things like zoom and panel discussions and and art and language and um all of that but i think that um i think to answer michelle's question there's this thing about public space that's actually um Oh my gosh, this is going to be hard to say a lot. I've never really tried to say this. But it's like it's the spacelessness. It's the space of when you can encounter something when you're not expecting to. It's when you think you're navigating something that you can take for granted. Um, when you go to the grocery store, you have, store you have a scripted relationship to it. When you go to the doctor, you have a scripted relationship to it. Um, when you're at home, you have a known set of parameters and how you interact with that. But in the public, you have this. Um, it's much more open and so I think there's this kind of emotional and physical sense of navigation that we're constantly doing and so what we can encounter in those spaces can um, be like the sticky velcro that our curiosity or our sense of history or our sense of ourselves can stick to in a much better way even than when we're at home you know people think that we express ourselves at home in our best way and I think we actually how we do it in public is much more um, authentic and so um i'm constantly working to kind of turn that paradigm over of like that the artist is in control of public art but actually that it needs to respond to the people that are navigating it um and that to instead of say oh this is an installation and an opening and we're having this event to say we're actually responding to the billion years that led us to this moment and the thousand years of human colonial presence and you know so it's like the moment that you put something in public it's this opportunity to create a periscope into the past and future and to like go subterranean and then to just shoot a rocket ship into the future and you know i just i think that the public's a very overlooked space in that way of being where we're vulnerable you know and and vulnerability is wonderful we don't allow ourselves to be vulnerable very often often so there, there, there's something, I, I don't know why I want to take the most cosmic statement of the evening, something that just made me smile and turned it into a, the most pragmatic thing that I'm going to say of the evening. Um, but, but one of the things that's really befuddling to me is you're, you're, you're absolutely right. You know, the public is really the place where everything comes together and all of the spirit is released and there's just so much more chance for, for vulnerability and reality to be experienced. But it's also puzzling that from the perspective of navigating how to do work in that realm right private work is so easy because you just have to appeal to one person and you just have to sort of you know there's nothing really you have to cut through it's just okay i like it do it done you know and if you want to work in the public then all of the things that make the public you know magic um are also the things that make the public challenging right because then it's not just about one person's perspective or placating like one person's ego, then you really do have to have all those considerations in mind. And it really is about, you know, how, how sophisticated of a person are you that you can respond to so many different variables at once and still create something that's meaningful. If we're talking about creation, which I mean, I'm sort of chiming or harping on Michelle's word interventions where, you know, what, what is that thing? Um, so it's kind of funny, it like feels like the place where you should be most free, but on like, you know, the, the bureaucratic side of things, it's the place where you're almost least free. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, I, I'm not sure how this ties in, but I used to do um, installations or these big webs in old Fort Townsend. And um, it, in a way it, it was kind of like graffiti art. I never knew if they would be there the next time I came because I never asked anyone if I could do them. Um, you know, they were big. They were in the woods, off the trails. And so, uh, one time I made a map and gave it to friends so they could find it. But I, I, other than a couple kids sort of tripping over me one time saying, you know, like, what do you do with your time? You like, you do this with your time, you know, it's just like, Oh my God, what are you? But, um, I, I was thinking it's, it's sort of like doing graffiti or something. Uh, some people see it, some people don't. Um, I, 
I don't know how, how, where that fits, but I did feel like I was working in the public, although the public, quote, of peoples of the public, not very many saw them. The works themselves? Yeah. Yeah. Well, and then the converse side of that is something that we've seen recently with these huge public monuments that a huge amount of resources and time have put in, been put into and that we just learn to walk past them and not engage with them as interventions and as expressions of our values. We just learn to walk past them and think of them as, um, you know, these objects that are just in our midst that have no meaning and have no gravitas. And, and um, I'm determined to help reinvigorate those. So I think there's this whole thing about how we, um, how we decamouflage what's in our midst, whether is it, whether you're making art in the woods that's meant to be stumbled upon, or if someone has made a monument 150 years ago that none of us agree with anymore, how, you know, how do we take the veil off of that? I and think it transitions into reflecting back on Aaron's project because you know many people walk who live in this area walk through the fort all the time, um, myself included, and yet when the stencils started popping up, it definitely made it a much more fresh and reflective experience to be there than it ever had been. Mm, definitely. I'd like to invite people to put your questions or comments into the chat. If you've not used them before or aren't familiar with chat, toward the bottom of your screen, you'll see what looks like a little bubble with the word chat below it. You can click on it and then send a message. I'm happy to read out your questions or comments to the group in these last several minutes of our talk. There, there is something about, uh, Glow, your comment about what's seen that is a little bit, like work that doesn't get seen. It's like when the forest or the tree falls in the forest and no one's around to hear it, doesn't make a sound. You know, if, if the work isn't seen or if the work isn't seen by a lot of people, does that detract from its value in any way, shape or form? And I guess there are, there, there are two things, directions I wanna go with that comment. The first is, um, I, I'm often of the belief that having one meaningful interaction is more valuable than having a thousand lesser meaningful interactions. So if you can genuinely happen upon something and genuinely be moved by it and it can be one person and that is something that they can really take away, then I think that's, that's at another level than just kind of superficially impacting people. Um, but the other thing is, is the work, even independent of anybody's personal engagement with it is still work that you're doing and you're actually interfacing with the environment that you're interfacing with. So you are creating a connection between you and that environment. And that's a real thing too. And that's where it becomes a little bit more metaphysical where it's like your relationship with the trees or pulling on the trees with, with the, the, the web material or, you know, when you walk away, like how does that change anything that's acting around it? Or are there other variables that are maybe a little bit beyond our comprehension that could be impacted by that work? Uh, which kind of takes us down a little bit more of a fruity wormhole. But I think, you know, is there animal interaction with the work? W whatever it might be, it's not, it's not limited to just, you know, how many likes you get for your photo, right? There are like all these different layers of value that happen. And if you don't put that energy out into the world, it can never be responded to. I, I, I must admit that I did them uh, as a kind of meditation in place. And, um, and they served me for that. And they, it reflected back to me in its, you know, being there, yeah. And as the creator, you can also be somebody that has an experience with it. Right. Yeah. I think that it might bond. I'm not as familiar with your work, Globe, but that Aaron and I have in common, and I'm sure many artists, but that art is sometimes viewed as this kind of finished product. It's considered the punctuation point at the end of a sentence. And for so many of us, it's the way that we're exploring the world. It's the way that we're interrogating and researching and archiving our experience and um, to kind of frame it as the end punctuation versus the comma or the pause or the, 
moment of investigation, I think really sh uh, makes too brief the, the definition of what art is. I, I've heard it um, termed like ashes from the fire as far as the end piece. And I, I sort of relate to that quite often. And I think, I, li I like this punctuation analogy because I, I always, you know, you think about the, the percent, like I always talk about it as a percentage, right? You have like a hundred percent of a project you're working on and how much of that. And I usually are on the side of five to 10% of it is seen. And then the rest of it is kind of all behind the scenes or whatever. Um, and it's also, you know, that becomes part of it too. Like with any, with anything is the deliverable is just the deliverable and it becomes some punctuation point but there's you know how many interactions that happen along the way like how many thought bubbles like how many iterative conversations do you have with people like how many you know do you talk to someone in the supply store do you talk to someone in the permitting agency do you talk to a friend who tells you it's a terrible idea do you like how are you moving through space and developing this project and how much of a part of you is it actually and that that's actually the thing you know you carry these things with you for months or years and you talk about all the reasons why it's important with all the people who might care about it. And then those are all people who are having experience with the work. And, you know, I was kind of joking when you asked me what the project was and I was like, Oh, it's not really a project. It doesn't really matter. Um, and I kind of wish I was serious because I don't know that it would make, I mean, it would make a difference, but it would also not make a difference to certain people who have already been impacted, whether it's a physically manifested or not. Mm -hmm. And, and I think that's something that uh, at least the four of us all kind of share in common because the work doesn't necessarily have to have a deliverable to be part of us and to be part of our daily conversations and part of the ways that, you know, in whatever small way we can, trying to just make some kind of inspired impact on, on our groups, on, on our communities, on just kind of the, the physical world around us. Mm -hmm. Can I ask Shelly a question based on that? Yeah. I just... Like I work a lot with small historical societies and places that are trying cool. to frame ecological histories, but it's like there's often this desire to like tie up all the loose ends and to curate it into an exhibition or to create it like a data set or a white paper about what something means. And so I guess, is there a shifting in your professional field that allows for these more open-ended inquisitive processes? Um, it feels like the world is shifting that way, but I, I sometimes wonder if that's just my perspective because I'm an artist that I think it's becoming more open-ended. I'm just really curious about how you incorporate open-ended research in your field. Yeah, great question. Um, yeah, I feel like what I've been wanting to say, like in between all of this, right, and especially with the like punctuation analogy is that it, it like a lot of this work, including the work that I'm doing at the Historical Society is like part of a really, really long conversation and when I think about the, one of the things that's like a tenant of doing oral history work is that the interviewer is in no way separate from the narrator's story. We are a guiding force along the way. Every single question is a guiding force, even though it's totally about their story or about that artwork that's being created all of the other influences that happened in my life are coming into that interview. All of the, right, it's, and in that way, all of this energy from everywhere enters each thing that we do, and that is ongoing. Um, it doesn't end when, when, we, when we stop pushing record. It doesn't, this conversation doesn't end when we say goodbye tonight, right? It just, it won't. And, you know, in terms of the field, man, there, you know, our, the museum sector in particular is, is being turned upside down right now. And that is amazing. It's really, really healthy and, um, and hard for a lot of, a lot of people. I mean, and I think when, he, when, like, part of the question, when you started asking your question was partly around, like, tying things up with a pretty bow and then being like, hey, check it out. Um, and a piece of that is about funding. It's about where the resources came from, what the funder would like to see, what, what the bow is that you said you would have at the end of in your grant proposal and so on and so forth, right? 
and we all know this that there's sort of that paradigm exists it exists for artists as much as it does for organizations and institutions um how do we break that down a bit more and 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 part of the, like here we go in tangents right capitalism um tells us that that we need to buy something that there's there's like a product to be purchased and that artwork is one of those things and that project that we're going to complete and check off is another one of those things and um that you know this again like all of these this is a, con a massive conversation that all converges in so many different ways and um Aaron's project when it if and when it, it is spray painted over whatever's going to happen to it at the fort the those words will live within the people who experienced it and i think that's the other piece that i kind of wanted to ask all of you sort of based a little bit off of michelle's question too was um and then i guess it, it kind of goes back to glow's installations um how important is it to you that some of this the the work in the public space is participatory that there's some aspect of it that people are participating in or doing with it whether that's even just walking through that space and that's enough for participation or is it can you ever separate the participation out from an art that's in public space is that just an inherent piece? It, it's not. I no, think well, that, oh, go ahead, Aaron. No, no, I was, uh, please. <laughs> I, I guess I think of um, the participation happens on different levels. And I like, I think of doing something for the Anacortes Arts Festival where I'm I have a net hung and I have pipe cleaners for people to weave into that to make a drawing that will be done over four days that several hundred people will participate. That to me is like a certain kind and definable. And I, I really enjoy that. It, it's like setting up a framework for participation to happen. Um, but something like the, I, I do agree that just walking past something or, uh, you know, it happens on an inner level. Um, recently, I've done an installation up at the Tyler Street window, and um, I've gotten a lot of, I, I sent it out to friends, and I used to do, for years, I did installations there. And I realized that I never sent out any information on it. I just, you know, so people walked by, they didn't know who did it. And, you know, I had no, I had no feedback. And one of the things that I am realizing now is there's something about some kind of feedback from people that helps the work move on. And, um, I'm just really struck by that right now with this current installation and, and getting feedback from people. It blows my mind. And I've been doing this for years and it's just like, oh my God, what I, I well, interesting. <laughs> I guess I shook my head no immediately because I do believe in interaction and, and that is how art is best made is through collective process um, to reflect a collective consciousness. But I'm going to say right now, I'm, I'm thinking in the larger than human and the, um, you know, the expanded time frame that might not include humans. Um, I know that sounds groovy and weird, but like, I just, I just made a monument to the future of Indianapolis that I had a bunch of activists start smashing up this piece of rock and it'll sit in the middle of the new justice center for the city of Indianapolis. So every person that gets arrested or arraigned, every judge, every lawyer will have to look at this. You know, and we have a million year loan agreement with the city of Indianapolis. My art supposedly will outlast the city, in my opinion, and it will crumble and it will fall apart. So that's the interaction I'm most interested in is like, how do you embrace time? How do you embrace change? How do you make space for transformation? Um, 
it's a hard thing to put words to because it's bigger than language. But um, I guess I love that it starts with a human interaction, but I'm really pushing art and everyone I know is thinking in that more expanded time frame of that interaction doesn't have to be solely human and solely within our lifetimes or solely within capitalism or solely within the art context. Um, well, this, this kind of deep time contemplation, it brings some people a sense of peace. I think in many others, it brings them total panic. And I think in, in these times with um, so many things going on that are so tumultuous that uh, there's a lot more panic than peace when you think of longer mm -hmm. time frames and how this will affect generations yeah. and what is happening with humanity. But time, you know, time is this kind of magical, it, I've said the word magical way too many times in this conversation. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. It, we um, love but but time is also something that I would say, you know, work and the appreciation of work is entirely subjective. But personally, I would consider something to be a lesser success if it has no component of time, which can be just anything beyond the immediate. And it's, you know, looking at something as kind of like a superficial flat experience that hits you over the head in that moment and then you walk away and there's no takeaway which I think is maybe impossible, but if there was no takeaway and there was no way to extend that moment of time into something else of any duration, then I think you sort of start to lose the value. And I think that that indirectly touches on the concept of time being an important player in the value of work, but it also touches on at least one of the wrinkles of participation, because if there's no you know, audience or there's no reactive component that like can transcend that moment in time, then, then you're kind of creating something that's almost like a, like a complacent, you know, uh, it's like a stale gesture that doesn't really do much. Um, which I'm, I'm not saying that these things have to be like the most robust catalyst to ignite, you know, tidal waves of change. But if, if you can't even transcend a single moment of time, then what is, what is the purpose of the resources that go into that? So I'd love to share some of the comments and questions that have been pouring in, and I'll try to get to all of them. Um, let's see. So someone's saying a still gesture can still disrupt. As long as it keeps going. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, back here. Oh. Someone's asking, Rick York is asking, did you have trouble choosing which quotes to include? There must be many you wanted to include, but you ran out of locations to add your art. I found all of them and photographed them too. And I enjoyed the stories I created when I viewed each one. Um, I, I, I love the end of that more than the beginning. <laughs> um, yeah, of, co of course, there were ones I wanted to include. I wanted to include all of it, but it, it becomes impossible really, really quickly. So, you know, I just made some rules for myself and tried to pick things that cover different thematic topics within a certain length and it became more of an exercise and what was uh, comfortable by, you know, by the collective agreement of the, the, the permitting limitations and the material limitations and all the things that are not really fun to talk about. Um, but, you know, there's, I think there's also more isn't always more and there was kind of like a delicate balance between spacing these out in a way that would be discoverable but not you know too oversaturated um one of the things that i think is most kind of beautiful about the fort itself is just how raw the the old batteries are how raw they are in the landscape and i didn't want this to become about a really heavy-handed gesture that transformed the entirety of these walls into you know, a really long winded oral history. It was really still about the fort walls themselves and your own relationship or your own experience discovering them. And as you move through space, kind of like if you're in you know, your childhood home, there's not 14 people in every room. You know, there's, you know, you have your family and you have certain people in certain places and you discover them as you discover them. Um, but I think, you know, it was actually, to, to be totally honest, it was a little bit of a position that I was not entirely comfortable with um being kind of the selector of things because it's not you know i think everybody who would go through these oral histories would have their own excerpts that they'd want to pull out and the only thing i can really say is um you know my, my hope or my justification in that was 
these are the things that I can put out there as the teasers. And I just hope that people kind of, you know, go into the Jefferson County archives and read through them in more detail and, you know, maybe come up with the ones that they like better and then email Shelly. <laughs> Sally Warren had this to say, I like Glow's idea about spaciousness in regards to disruption of expectations in public spaces too. Encountering the unexpected in public expands one's sense of possibilities. Encountering Aaron's work at the fort uses the past to become part of the present in a way that feels spacious. Mm -hmm. I, I do think one of the things that's really nice about or adding to the conversation before about public space or work in public spaces, it does tend to feel a little bit more, I, I like the word spacious. Um, I think there's not quite as much a preconception when you're in public space as to what you're supposed to think, feel, you know, consume, respond to, react. And I think even just psychologically that feels more spacious, even if the space isn't bigger, but generally public work does have more space around it than being in the confines of, of a museum space or a gallery space. So, you know, getting outside the art space lets you have a more genuine or authentic interaction with the world around you or something. I think that's going to be a silver lining of COVID is that we're all really wondering what these spaces can generate because we're not inhabiting them physically right now. So they've become, they've become conceptual spaces. And I think it's so hard sometimes when we're utilizing space, when we're interacting with it daily, um, it's very hard to to conceive of the space as as a space for some, for something expansive or generous or um, spacious, and so maybe right now because we're kind of pausing and pulling back, we get to rescript that a little bit in the future. And I'm I'm actually really excited to see the what next of the post COVID public art world because I think it might um, push some thresholds away that were very unnecessary about. Um, kind of that spaciousness and generosity and vulnerability. And it is fun. I know, I know Shelly and I had a couple of conversations just about what the, the, the future of certain types of institutional spaces can mean if they have a little bit more opportunity to exist in public spaces. And I don't know one has to replace the other, but I think the relationship can be strengthened between the two. And, you know, if, I, I also like to kind of play this weird little role of the, the artist as the person you can hang the pin on or blame for things. Um, so I think sometimes working with like a, almost like an artist as liaison to play with some of these new ideas and concepts and work with, okay, well, we wanna to try to do this, but we don't really have the, the means or you know, don't necessarily feel comfortable doing that politically. Like you can then negotiate through other creative strategies to to play with those ideas and i think covid you know it, yeah it might be one of those silver linings because i think everybody is thinking about everything differently no matter you know how we come out of this we're going to think about everything differently mm -hmm. yeah thanks for bringing that positive perspective back and you know let's let artists inherit the earth <laughs> Like, and that is, if that's what happens post-COVID, that would be a beautiful, beautiful world. That's actually what this talk was about, right? Is <laughs> just Sally, starting. Sally, you wrap that up perfectly. <laughs> Let's start that collective process. There was a comment in there about Robin Hood somewhere, and I want to I wanna bring that back. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks to everyone who, who joined this conversation, both um, the group of panelists and everyone, close to 30 people at one point were here and taking part of this. Um, I just, I had a wonderful time and it was great seeing all of you. And um, this whole conversation has been recorded and the York Salon will be posted on the North Wind and the Port Townsend School of the Arts websites for people to review um, in the coming weeks. Thanks everybody. Thank you all. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks everyone. Thank you, Jenna. Have a good night. Good night.
Thanks, Aaron. Good night. Good night, good night.